Well, this weekend, we are jumping back in the book of Romans. And maybe some of you, if you've been new over the last few weeks, we started the book of Romans, we covered about three chapters of it and took a pause for the last series. And now we're back in Romans. And we're in Romans chapter four today. And, and I would encourage you, uh, go ahead and take a Bible out, your Bible out. If, if you have it on, on your phone, you can pull it up on the phone. If you've got your Bible with you, open it to Romans chapter four. If you didn't bring either, you don't have one, um, I'm gonna encourage you, the blue Bibles that are in front of you, that's why they're there. I think there's something uh, valuable, the tactile, the reading together, it stimulates our brain in different ways, helps you understand, maybe you're new at reading through the Bible and it's difficult, so we'll read through some passages. Part of that, not just to teach, but to train us of how do I interact with this book, this revelation from God. If you're using the blue Bible in the room, it's page 1,119. Just turn to page 1,119. And if you need a Bible, especially that's the translation I use, feel free to take that one. That's why they're there. They're not there because we want to keep Bibles here in the room. They're there for people to be able to use. So take it with you if you want to. As we look at it, we, we kind of got to dive back into a Romans frame of mind just to catch us up. And especially if you go, man, I wasn't here. Am I lost? You're at a great place to start this series. As we look at the book of Romans, I'll just tell you, Paul, who I think is just the greatest apostle of the New Testament, in my opinion, I love all of them, but you know, he planted more churches, he wrote more books, he traveled and spread it. And Romans is his magnum opus. I mean, it, it, it's his opportunity to write a letter to the church in Rome, which is the capital of the world. It's the intersection of all world events. And so if you can influence the people there, you can influence the church there, you have the opportunity to impact how the whole world thinks about Jesus and specifically this good news. And so when Paul's writing this book, it's his most thorough, it's his most detailed, it's his most thought through. And remember, he's writing an audience, it's a church that's come together and there's kind of two groups in the church. A lot of the church are those who are Jewish believers. They've come out of Judaism and some of them are struggling with holding on to some of the ways of thinking. And then a lot of them are from other nations, especially from Roman culture. And they have a whole different paradigm of how they think about God. And you've got these two groups mixed together. And in that, what Paul's presenting here for both of them is a paradigm shift. And when I use that term paradigm shift, a, a paradigm is, is a way of seeing the world. It's a perspective that seems so clear, so obvious that everyone agrees with this. And Thomas Kuhn, the scientist and philosopher, he, he coined the term paradigm shift. And he used it scientifically because you can look through history of science, there's several key paradigm shifts. When, when science went from a Ptolemaic way of looking at the universe, that the earth was the center of the universe, to a Copernican way of looking at the universe that the sun is the center of our galaxy, at least. I mean, that shift, it was a total shift in the way they looked at it. You, you, you can look at it, the shift with the, the evidence of Big Bang Theory that the earth actually had a beginning and is expanding. There's been a total paradigm shift. Instead of looking at it, of going, wait, matter was eternal. In, in the same way, we use the term, a paradigm shift of how we think. When, when you've approached something one way for so long, you think everybody sees it that way and then you go through something or some new discovery and you look at it and you go, man, this turns it around. I mean, I think for many of us, the pandemic has been a paradigm shift. If you'd asked me two years ago, I mean, I heard it all the time. They would say, you know, you could have a, a, a virus or a disease that could cause a worldwide pandemic. You know, it, always, it always sounded like, okay, yeah, warning, warning, warning. And then we have it. And you kind of see the world differently and you see how it impacts all of us. You see us globally differently. See how we look at work and home and all of that. As Paul's writing this book of Romans, he's coming to an audience who think they've got pretty much religion figured out. They've got life figured out. And for the Jewish audience, for them, they've got it figured out. We're right with God really for three reasons. One, we're Jews and we're God's chosen people. Two, we have the sign of circumcision. And we talked about that earlier. Man, if you're circumcised, you're in. And, and then the third part, we obey God's Mosaic law. Man, we're the ones that have the law and we obey the law. And that was their paradigm. For, for the, the Greeks and for the Romans, their paradigm is that gods don't really care about you. Gods serve themselves and your whole 
opportunity in life is only make sure you please them and you might get something out of them. And Paul says, no, I, I want to proclaim something that is fundamentally different. And in it, you saw the theme of the book. Here's his theme. I've got good news. That's what the word gospel means. Good news. I got really good news. You can actually be right with God and with yourself and with each other. You, you can actually have a relationship with God in a way that all things are right. Every, everything you've done wrong is forgiven. You, you, you are right with him. That's what it means to be righteous. But, but not only that, with yourself. All the things you're struggling with internally, not only that, with other people as well. He, he said that theme in Romans 1.16. He says, I'm not ashamed. I don't pull back from this good news. Why? It's the power of God. Only God could do this for salvation. That's what that salvation, what is he saving us from? He's saving us from damnation because we're not right with God. He's saving us from ourselves. He's saving us from the destruction with each other. And it's for everybody who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. And then notice he says, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. And look at these terms, from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And this is the key paradigm shift, this word right here. That, that it is not you're right with God because you did the right things or you were circumcised or you're Jewish. It's not you're right with God because you appease these gods who are so capricious anyway. It's this radical plan that you could actually be right with God, but here's the key, it's only through faith. And faith is this concept that you're gonna have to understand. Now, we looked at it, to get there, he said, let me tell you the bad news. All of us are more messed up than we want to admit. And we, we spent three chapters on it. If you were here, it was long. And he, he just spent a lot of time going, everybody's messed up. The people that are far from God, they're really messed up. You read Romans 1. But then he moves to Romans 2 and he says, yeah, but actually moral people are messed up too. They're not as moral as they think they are. Even religious people. And then he ends it, even Jewish people. And part of his audience is like, What? And he, I love this verse, he says in Romans 3.10, no one is righteous, not even one. No one gets there. No one's done it. But then he turns it at the end of chapter three that we have the opportunity to be right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. I, I love these verses. He says, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard, yet in God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. It's all through Christ, it's, it's God's plan, it's God's grace, it's God's initiative, it's God's power, it's God's sustaining. But the means through which we experience it is faith. And it's so important that we grab that. Uh, it's a crude illustration in one way, but, but it pictures it, if you kind of picture it like a train, a train to an eternal destination and the train itself, God came up with the train. God gave us the train. God invites us to be a part of the train. God lets us be on the train, experience all the good that's in that. And ultimately we're going to a place that's even better than the train itself, but the ticket is faith. It's faith. Now, again, it, it's a crude illustration in one way, but, but it, it is, Paul is trying to drive home this point because it's such a paradigm shift for them. Now, it's not a paradigm shift for God, by the way. This is what he's been teaching all along. That's why Paul always keeps quoting the Old Testament because he wants to show them this is what God was doing all along. But somewhere along the way, especially the Jewish audience, and we'll see quite a bit in this chapter, man, they really thought it was well, it's because we're Jews, we're, Abraham's our father and we're special people or it's because we have the sign of circumcision. It, it's because we, we are the people that have kept God's law. And so he's gonna use Abraham as an example to teach us about faith, to help us understand that. Because they needed a paradigm shift. Now, let me tell you here, we need one in a lot of ways when it comes to the subject of faith as well. Because for a lot of people, you mentioned faith, and, and frankly, if you're outside the church or maybe you've not been a part of church and you hear this, you go, yeah, of course, that's what all you church people do. It's just faith. 
Just gotta have faith and it's just kind of this leap of faith and it's this squishy subject. And yet if you look at scripture, I mean, it is so fundamentally important. Paul says, I wanna make sure you understand it. And so as we look at this, we wanna understand our faith. And chapter four is a great chapter to do that. Now, the first thing I just wanted to find biblical faith. Biblical faith is trusting God because we believe what he has shown us and told us. It's trusting God. Biblical faith, when I say it comes down to that belief, when it comes down to that trust, it's not just intellectual facts about God. I'm literally trusting him. Hebrews puts it this way. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. There's a trust factor because there's part of it I don't see. But I trust him based on what he has revealed, what he has shown us in the universe, in the life of Christ, what he has told us through his word. And and so when you, you think about faith, I mean, at a fundamental level, most of us here, we would say, I believe in God. That is a statement of faith. We can't see him. We can't prove it and prove his existence. Now we can point to evidence of it, but but proving it, there's a statement of faith there. Now, maybe you're here or you're hearing this and you'd say, I don't believe in God. I don't believe there's a God that exists. I'm not a person of faith. Actually, I would disagree. That's a faith statement as well. Because you can't prove that he doesn't exist. So by faith, you're using the evidence you have to go, okay, I don't believe he exists. Both are faith statements. And we could spend the rest of time arguing the rationality of which of those statements. I'm just pointing out now, this biblical faith, we have it based on what God has shown us. And so then when we go in this chapter, faith is based on your belief, not your behavior. Faith is based on your belief, not your behavior. Let's read through first major section of Romans four. And as I go through it, again, I'll explain certain parts of the, on it, but we'll drill down in it as we go later. Read with me starting in verse one. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? Now, remember a big part of this audience, Jewish audience. So he says, let's talk about father Abraham. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him. If you've got your Bible, you might wanna mark that counted to him. It was credited to him. That word is used 11 times in this chapter. It's really important that God's gonna credit, God's gonna give based on faith. It was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. The one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is a man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. And then he's going to the subject of circumcision. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? Because remember part of his audience said, we're right with God because we're the circumcised. And he says, okay, let's, let's examine that. For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. Wait a second, if circumcision is the key and Abraham had righteousness before he was circumcised, what was going on there? He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all of us who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who walk in the footsteps of the faith of our father Abraham before he was circumcised. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it's adherence to the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That's why it depends on faith. All right, let me, let me summarize what he's saying there. And just in it, because he's addressing what that audience was struggling with. And so in that audience, he looks at it. Notice he says, it's not just based that Abraham's our father as a Jew. It's not just based on circumcision because he was justified before he was circumcised. It's not just based because he kept the law, because if he kept the law, then it was something he was doing, not what God was doing out of it. 
And then he broadened, notice he broadened when he was talking there, that he's not just the father of some people, he's the father of faith for all of us, whether you're Jewish or not. I don't know, when I, when I was a kid, we used to sing a song in church, Father Abraham. Anybody do that? Remember Father Abraham? And many sons, many sons had Father Abraham, and I'm one of them, so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. Right arm, then you shake your right arm. It's kind of like a church version of the hokey pokey. You know, you kind of see, sing it through. Now, now what that song, it's based on this chapter. That, that Abraham is our father, not just by descent, by, remember our key word here, by faith. And Paul wants to make sure the whole church recognizes we all can look to him as the father of faith. Now, as we came in here today, I doubt many of us were struggling with the same issue that a lot of the Roman church was dealing with. I doubt anybody here today came in and says, you know, I'm right with God just because I'm Jewish or whatever nationality you are. I doubt you said I'm right with God because circumcision. I'm right with God because I keep the Mosaic law. That's not really what we struggle with, but we still struggle with this concept of faith. In fact, if you look at this chapter, it helps us understand maybe some of the paradigm shift we need to do when it comes to the concept. And, and so you look at it, the first thing you see, faith is not because you did the right things. Faith is not because you did the right things. Now we don't hold on to the law per se or circumcision and that, but we kind of have our list of right and wrong. And, and it's interesting to me, you'll talk to people out there and, and even when you say, hey, are you a person of faith or will you wanna have a relationship with God or you wanna get right with God, immediately you know where people go to? Well, if I'm gonna get right with God, well, I gotta clean up my life, I gotta stop doing stuff. We immediately go to behavior. And, and a lot of people kind of count themselves out because they go, well, I could never get my act together. I could never do that. I'll talk to some people, they go, I'd love to come to your church, but man, if I walked in the building, lightning would strike me if you knew the stuff I did. And to me, it's, it's that thinking though. Man, I do bad things, so I can't be a person of faith. But he says explicitly here, wait, it wasn't based on behavior, it wasn't based on Abraham's behavior. If it was based on behavior, then you earned it. And when you earn something, it's not a gift. Look, look how he put it in four and five. He says, when people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they've earned. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. When, when you work for something, it's not a gift. I doubt the last time you got a paycheck, when you got your paycheck or you saw it hit your account with it, I bet you didn't sit down and get out some thank you notes and go, you know, I need to write a note to my boss. I need to write a note to the company. Thank you so much. I mean, thank you for giving that to me. It is so much. I don't deserve it. And you keep doing it every, twice a month. <laughs> no, nobody thinks like that. No, what do we do? We pull out that paycheck and we go, is that all? <laughs> For all I did and all the work I did? And then, and then as one of my kids said, you know, they go, who is this FICA? What are they doing with my money? <laughs> See, when you work for something, it's like, that is what's owed me. See, that's what's fundamentally different with this. By the way, we actually, as humans, we kind of like it this way with God. This is why we create religions this way. Because it's much more radical. If you go to faith as something that's totally as a gift from God, if there's no part of it that I earned, then I can't look at God like he owes me anything. If I didn't earn anything, then I have to trust him with everything. Whew. That's what makes it so radical. That's why it's such a paradigm shift that's so different than any religion out there. Every religion out there is based on what you earn. That, that you, you have to earn it in order to deserve it. And Christianity comes with this radical gift, but it's a radical gift that actually asks more because I've got to trust him that much more. Then as you, you look at this, I, I love the other part of it. It's not lost because you did the wrong things. It's not lost because you did the wrong things. I didn't earn it because I did the right things 
and I don't lose it because I did the wrong things. Remember in the middle of this, he quotes David. He's been talking about Abraham, but he picks some verses from David. And look at this quote from David. And David also speaks, this is from Psalm 32, of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteous apart from works. Look at David's words. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Now, why do you think he chose David? Because David knew what it was like to be a sinner. I mean, think about King David. We love King David. They love King David. He was a hero. He's a man after God's own heart. But when you want to kind of look at the list, and I'm not talking like the minor stuff, you want to look at the list of the major sins you could commit. David, who committed adultery with Bathsheba, and not just adultery, used his power as a king to make it happen. That's pretty ugly. David, who lied about it again and again and again. David, who covered it up. David, who manipulated with his general the army in a way that the husband of the woman was killed in battle. I mean, I, I don't care what your list of bad sins are, David checks all the boxes. And yet David comes and he was forgiven. And, and Paul purposely quotes him that he was forgiven. Doesn't diminish what he did, but, but it's this powerful concept of faith in God that even overcomes my sin. And some of you, you need to hear this. Some of you that actually have been in church for a long time because you live in this fear that, okay, yeah, I'm right with God today, but what if I really blow it tomorrow? What if I do something really wrong? I mean, what if I, I mean, I go way off the reservation and then I'm lost and I lost my faith and I lost. And, and you're fearing something that is anti-gospel. The only reason you're on the reservation, the only reason you're on the train to begin with is God. And you actually put your faith in him. The only reason you stay on the train is God. And so you keep your faith in him. And, and even in our sinfulness, God is able to overcome it in Christ. You don't have to live in fear of that. And Paul wants to make sure that we recognize it's not based on what you did right. It's not what, based on what you did wrong. And, and the third thing is strictly because of what God did and continues to do, which is grace. It's strictly based on what God did. Look how he says it. Clearly God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's laws, not because Abraham did the right things in the law, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. So the promise is received by faith. It is a gift given as a free gift and we are all certain to receive it whether or not we live according to the law of Moses if we have faith like Abraham. See, it's based on your belief, your faith, your trust, not your behavior. Now, as I say that, that makes some of us real nervous. You go, well, wait, wait a second, Tim, and, you know, where's obedience come in? And I go, obedience is absolutely there. That's why you need the book of James. He's pretty clear about it, faith without works. But here's the key. Obedience is the result of faith, not Faith is the result of obedience. One of those is the gospel. One of those is every other religion. And if you miss it at this point, there are people all over the planet who are giving their lives because they're trying to be obedient enough to be right with God. And the radical part of Christianity, the radical grace is Christ was enough. And my faith in him is enough and it's out of the fruit of that faith that obedience comes. But as I look at it, the ticket, my, my ticket is faith. I rest in faith. And I'm not living in fear about what I'll do wrong. Now, as I say that, some of you go, whoo hoo, I'm liking this. I got my ticket and my ticket's secure so I'll just, uh, you know, do what I want the rest of my life. <laughs> If that really is your mentality, you, you might want to check your ticket. It's probably not real faith. And, and here's why I would say that. 
If, if you're sitting here saying, I just want a ticket to be in heaven one day, but I really don't want to be a part of it in any way, I, I would go, you really don't want to go to heaven. You want to go to a place where we're all going to worship and obey and glorify God all the time, but you're saying right now, I don't want to do that at all in this lifetime. Why would you want to do it when you're actually in his presence? And I don't say this scare you or anything. It's just a good opportunity to go, yeah, what is it that I really want? And so, so this radical faith that we have, it's due to Christ and it's based on his grace. Now in that, you then ask yourself, what's the most important part of that faith? What's the most important part of faith when we understand that? And a lot of times we go, well, the most important part of faith is you have strong faith. You have deep faith. You have passionate faith. You have committed faith. Actually, I say all those are wrong. The most important part of your faith is the object of your faith. The object of your faith. Because we're going to see in, in Abraham, if you know his story, man, at times he makes really bad decisions. At times he gets scared. Lies about his wife a couple of times. He and Sarah kind of come up with their own plan in different ways. Not really good decisions. But, but Paul's going to note, he never stopped in the object of his faith. Look at it. He says, that's why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only the inherent of the law, but also the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. He, he looked at Abraham, he made this promise, you're the father of many nations in the presence of God, and look at this line, in whom he believes, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that did not exist. See, Abraham had this radical promise of God that he looked at this old couple and he says, you're gonna have a baby. And from your baby is gonna come great nations. And from those nations would be the blessing to all the earth. And, and that's why Paul says, it's, he, he brings life to the dead because they were looking at them, man, our bodies are pretty much dead at this point. He can make things exist that have never existed before. And, and the key line in this is, in the presence of God in whom he believed. See, God was the object of his faith. That's why the most important thing that you can have is not that you have strong faith, not that you have radical faith, not that you have passionate faith. There are people all over the planet right now that I would say they have more faith than I do. They are more passionate. They're more sacrificial. They're doing more radical names, things in the name of their faith. But the key is, what's the object of the faith? I'll give you an example of it. So... I love March Madness. I don't know, anybody else join March Madness? My brackets are in flames, but I love March Madness. And particularly this year, I'm a huge Arkansas Razorback fan. So it's fun having them in San Francisco. Thursday night was glorious. The Razorbacks beat Gonzaga, got to go to the game. I was like, this is great. Last night was not so much fun. Duke kind of mopped them up a little bit. But if going into that game, let's say you and I, you're a Duke fan, I'm an Arkansas fan. And before the game, the two of us sit down together and we're gonna put a bet on the game. We're, we're calling you know, the agent, we're gonna put a bet on it. And in this scenario, let's say we have the exact same amount of finances, all things are equal in it. And, and I place a $10,000 bet on Arkansas. And you place a $100 bet on Duke. All right, let me pause here. I am not encouraging gambling or betting, okay? It's just an illustration, okay? It's one of the quickest ways. If, it, it, save yourself a trip and just go to the toilet and flush your money because that, that's pretty much. You look, look at the casinos. Anytime you're in Vegas, look at the casinos and ask yourselves, I wonder where they got the money to build these big buildings. <laughs> you, out of your pocket, okay? So I'm not promoting gambling and that's just an illustration. And so I place 10,000, you place 100. If going into that game, you asked each of us who has greater faith in their team. Well, I obviously do. I put a lot more down on it. At the end of the game, does it matter that I had more faith if I bet on the wrong team? See, the key is the object of your faith. It's not that Abraham's the greatest man of faith. He never wavered in anything in that. He, he wavered in plans and decisions and different parts. But the part, and this is what Paul's pointing out here, the part he never wavered in, he never wavered in the object of his faith. He never stopped believing what God had said to him. 
And, and as you look at this, this object of faith, it, it's so important. You know, I'll hear people say from time to time, I've given up my faith or I've left the faith. And I always want to say, well, you haven't left the faith. You've just switched the object. You may have walked away from Christianity. You've just chosen a new object to put your faith in because all of us are living by faith. All of us are making choices based on it. It's just, what is the object that you've done it off of? And as you look at that, here's the key. How do you build that kind of faith? Here's what I say. There's two key building blocks to our faith. And you see Abraham does them. Here's the two building blocks of faith. If you want to grow in faith, first one is facts. Facts. Now, as I say that, again, this kind of changes our paradigm. Because a lot of times when you talk about faith, you don't talk about facts. Faith is just this ethereal thing and you just believe it. Uh, That's not what scripture teaches. That's not what Abraham did. Look at this. He did not weaken in faith when he considered. That word considered is, it's not like he thought about it lightly. He reckoned, he thought about it, he scrutinized. When he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he, he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. So Abraham looked at his life, looked at his body. He looked at the fact they got the promise was about 75, went for about 25 years. He got it again when he was 99. He's coming up on a hundred there. Angels show up and they say, you're going to have a baby. It's going to happen this next year. Sarah hears it in the tent. She's like, ha ha, right. Now, Abraham didn't live in this pie in the sky. When he got the promise all along, he looked at the facts. Man, we're too old for this. Our body's beyond this. I mean, you look at it medically. And there, there was no, you know, blue pill coming in the mail to help out here. And, and yet, okay, I'm going to look at the facts and trust God in line with that. And I say this because this is one of those places that I think it's real important. A lot of times we use faith as a form of denial. And we kind of build a a faith and and we kind of say, well, God's going to do this. God's going to show up. God, a a, a friend who worked for a Christian organization that was in major financial issues. And the books never added up and they went to the leader organization. They said, what are we going to do about it? And the leader was always, well, God's going to show up. You just got to have faith. And I look at that, that's a form of denial. See, faith takes the facts into consideration. Some of you, You need to to face the facts. You might need to face the facts about your marriage. You might need to face the facts about your finances. You might need to face the facts of what's going on with your health. You might need to face the facts on relationship. Face the facts with that. You don't say that because they're anti-faith. Facts are so important because they show me what God must do. They show me the points of it. Um, That's why I love the Easter season. Faith and facts go hand in hand. I love that we always have Easter. You're gonna hear about in the next few weeks. Because there's some facts in human history everybody's got to wrestle with. There's this fact that this man, Jesus, walked on the planet. There's too many sources everywhere that talk about it. There's these facts that he actually died on a cross. And there's biblical and non-biblical sources that point to it. This facts that he actually was walking around a few days later and hundreds of witnesses interact with him and touch him and see him. See, you have fact, you have fact, you have fact. Now between those facts, he died and then he's walking around. We got this real thing that we go, wait a second, dead people don't rise again. And so that's where we go, oh yeah, I have faith that something happened here. That God did something he's never done in human history. And and the reason I could grab that faith, the reason it's a reasonable faith is I'm actually building off of the facts of what God did show me so I can believe what he is telling me that happened. And I say the same is true in your life. You you need to look at maybe in your marriage, man, you have faith God can save it, but you might need to look at the fact, how is your spouse responding to this? In your finances, you have faith that maybe God can rescue us out of this. But I need to look at the facts of the lay of the land in this. I need to look at the facts of what's going on in that. See, faith is not like faith's over here and facts over here. They always go hand in hand. But with the facts, you have this second building block, which is the promises of God. See, I come to the facts of what are, and then I look, okay, what has God said? What has he actually promised? 
So Abraham, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. He grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced God was able to do what he had promised. That was why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. So Abraham looks at the facts of his body. We're not gonna have a baby on our own. We never have, she's been barren. But God made a promise. So I'm gonna bank on the promise. I'm gonna trust God's promise. And I think that is the key. It's one of the keys that why you need to interact with the Bible and you need to understand the Bible. What are the actual promises of God? What has God actually promised in this situation? What has God promised that he could do? And so I don't use faith as this denial of reality. I actually face the facts of reality. And then with that reality, I go, okay, what are the promises of God here that I can hold on to and I can bank on? Guys, it's so important that you have these two together. It's one of the reasons I don't like faith healers because I think they make promises God doesn't make. They create expectations that God hasn't promised. He can heal, but he may choose not to. He's promised believers that by his stripes we are healed so we know in eternity no disease will ever touch us. So for the bulk of your existence, the absolute bulk of your life, it will never touch you. And that's only because of Jesus Christ. I love that promise. But on this side of eternity, he may not heal you. And here's the deal. It wasn't because of your lack of faith. That's not how he works. And so that's why I, I, I don't like people who make these promises. And then if it doesn't come true, they blame you for it. And sometimes we do the same thing though. We create these expectations and then if it doesn't come through the way we thought it was supposed to come true, we get mad at God for it. That's why I think in our paradigm, we have to come back and go, okay, what are the facts of where my life is? And then what are the promises of God? And how do I build my life on his actual promises? Not what I just want it to be, but what he's actually promised. And so you start going through his word and you go, how do I have those assurances out of it? How do I know the promises of God in that? And I would say, do you know the promise? Do you know the promise of our sure salvation? He's promised that you're saved and it's not based on what you've done. Nobody can take that away from you. He promised that he will never leave me or forsake me. He's promised that if he began the good work in me, he is gonna be faithful to complete it. He's promised that all things will work out together for our good. He doesn't promise that all things will be good. Big difference. But he's promised that all things will work out together for our good. He's promised that the moment you're absent from your body, you're in his presence. He's promised that he will claim us as his own. He promised that he will personally wipe away every tear one day and they will exist no more. And these are just a few guys. But it's important that my faith is actually built on his promises. And so Abraham in his life, he looked at the facts of his body. He goes, I can't do this So God, but God promised me we're gonna have a kid. And they had a kid. And then when God looked at him one day and he said, I want you to take that boy and go sacrifice him on a mountain. And he's looking at it and he's going, wait a second. You told me from this boy, all the nations are gonna come. And now you're telling me to go kill this boy. You know what Hebrews tells us Abraham realized? He said, hey, if God told me to do it and he made a promise about it, that even if I sacrifice him, God will raise him from the dead. You see that kind of faith? But it's not just this pie in the sky faith. It's a faith built on the facts of what's going on. And it's a faith that goes with the promises of God. Final point of this passage and this, the focus of our faith is always Jesus. The focus is always Jesus. Look how he ends it. He says, but the words that was counted to him were not written for his sake, but ours. It can be counted to you and me too. It will be counted to us who believe in him And and again, he goes back to this point, who raised from the dead, Jesus, our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Paul always inserts this over again. When you're believing, remember, Jesus died and he rose for you. Jesus died and, and he rose again. The power of that resurrection, the power of the cross. And the reason he does that, and this is why it's so important, you need to hear this today, because sometimes when you're talking about this concept of faith, there's a lot that we can start focusing on and we lose focus. And sometimes we lose faith. I I do it in my life. There's concepts out there that we don't fully understand. And I start, if if I spend too much time, I'm looking at it, I I don't fully understand eternity. I don't fully understand how God always existed. My mind doesn't quite go there. I don't fully understand suffering in this world and the existence of evil. 
and why some people suffer a lot more than other people. I don't fully understand. I, I can get locked up at times. How's a God who's out outside of time and space actually inter interact in a time-space continuum and he's able to do it and he responds to what I'm doing in this continuum, but he's still outside of that. I don't exactly know how that works. And if I spend time just fixating on the beyond, I can talk myself into a place where I go, oh, man, my faith starts fraying. When those times happen, and they happen in all of us, and it's not just those kind of things, sometimes they fray because we get tired of other Christians or tired of the way people are interacting. You ever felt that where your faith gets weary? Listen to me, focus on Jesus. See, see, I can chase the things we don't quite understand. And actually what Paul's saying, what the writer of Hebrews said, man, when you're running the race of life, you need something to fixate on. You wanna fixate, you wanna focus, focus on Jesus. He's the author of your faith. He's the finisher of your faith. When I start doubting any other things, you know what I always come back to? I come back to no one yet has been able to explain to me, and I promise you, I've studied this a lot. No one has explained the story of the man Jesus who existed on this planet, the story that he actually died on a cross, and the evidence that I have studied that he actually rose from the dead. No one has explained that away. And so I fixate on what he did and the implication of that, and then I start fixating on his life itself and how he treated people and how he built his church and I build my faith from what's clear on the inside out instead of fixating on the outside and getting stuck and losing what's right in front of me. And so maybe you're here today and you've struggled with it. Yeah, I, I just would tell you, for some of you, you've never taken that faith step because all you do is you focus out there. Here's all I would encourage you. Would you just spend some time and focus on Jesus? Some of you are struggling in your faith today and you've walked with them for years. You're struggling in a lot of ways because I think you're probably focused on the wrong thing. Focus on Jesus. Focus on what he has promised. Focus on what he has done. As we finish out, here, here's just three things you see it in your notes. I just encourage you, ask yourself today, are there any ways that you've been confused in your understanding of faith? As you look back through the notes, you go, you know, I don't think I realized I was thinking that way. And in that, what is maybe one principle from this passage that you'd want to embrace and apply? Something that you go, yeah, I've got to apply that in my faith with it. And then ask yourself, what would it be like for you to focus on Jesus this week as the center of your faith? What would it be like instead of just having devotions or reading the Bible, when you read the Bible, you're, you're focusing on Jesus in that. When you're praying, you're praying in a way that it's not just about what's going on in the world, it's my relationship with Jesus. When you're even thinking about faith at all, and maybe you're here today and you're debating it, I would just ask you, this is a great season for you because we're going to talk a lot about Jesus. Could you just ask yourself, what do you do with this story that happened in history of what Jesus accomplished? And not only then, but what's happened over the last 2,000 years? And maybe for you, by focusing on him, you could take a first step of faith and see how that impacts your life. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you. I thank you for Paul. I thank you for just the brilliance of his mind, the way he lays out these concepts to help us understand. Lord, I thank you that you came up with this. Uh, we come up with a plan where we feel like we gotta work for it. You came up with a plan where you wanna give it. It is truly a gift. I pray today for anyone, maybe they walked in here and they would say, I, I just don't have any faith. Lord, I, I pray they would look at your promises, they'd look at Christ and what he accomplished and take a first step toward you. Lord, I pray for anybody here, maybe they came in, they're struggling with their faith. And I pray, maybe they've been focused on the outer edges and they need to focus back on the center of who you are. And for all of us who've received this gift of faith, I pray we would be people who honor and praise you in all of our lives. And we pray this in Christ's name, amen.